In this video, I'm going to share with you eight techniques which will instantly make your music sound more professional. Here's an example of an idea before I apply these techniques. I take the weight on my shoulders. And here's the idea after I've implemented all of these techniques. So this video is going to break down how you can get better sounding tracks by using the same techniques that professional music producers use. I'm also going to be breaking down a few examples of some hit tracks so you can directly hear how you can apply these techniques in your own music. Before we get stuck in, I want to say a huge shout out to my Accelerator students who have achieved some incredible things with their music this year, some of which I've linked to below this video. Okay, point number one is sticking to one vibe or theme for your track. Now this is easier said than done because you can be scrolling through loads of different samples or presets and come across something that works really well. But the question to ask yourself, is this appropriate for this track? Is it conveying the main theme or vibe for this track? If not, you need to make that decision. Does it stay or does it go? And you have to be quite brutal in culling the things that don't work. Now this is hard, especially if you do find something that sounds good, but you can always save it out as a separate project. If it makes you feel better, I know you'll never actually return to it, but it's nice to think that you will. Now sometimes you'll decide a theme before you begin. For example, you might know that you want to create a trance track or you might know that you want to create a piano pop track. And sometimes, of course, that inspiration just comes when you're listening to other music, when you're in the shower, or when you've just started fiddling around on the keyboard. So I'm going to show you a quick example of how this can happen. So in this example, I've got a vocal and a kick drum. I take the weight on my shoulders. And I want to be creating a piano house track. But if I just scroll through various presets in my plugins without having a clear goal, then I can stumble across stuff which sounds great, but it's just not really suitable for the vibe. So I might find a bass line that sounds like this. Which is kind of cool, but it's not really housey. And then without chords. That sounds cool too. Might be good for a trance track but not really for a piano house track. So just sounding good isn't enough of a deciding factor for whether you should use a particular sound. It's also got to be on brand and following that theme. So this is what I ended up with in terms of the bass. A much housier bass. And then the chords are piano. And that's going to give it that piano house vibe. And I have to make that decision for every sound that I choose. Okay, point number two is to use high quality ingredients. And by that, I mean use really good quality samples, presets, and audio. Now that's easier said than done, but thankfully there are so many great samples and presets available nowadays. And usually the ones that come included with your door just aren't up to scratch. And this is because depending on which genre that you choose to produce, there will be certain sample packs and preset packs that are more suited for that genre. But having said that, a few places that you can start to look would be Splice, you've got F9 Audio, you've got Loot Cloud, Black Octopus, ADSR, the list could go on, but the best thing to do is just Google search what's the best preset pack or what's the best sample pack for this particular genre of music. Check a few of them out. You can usually listen to a few of the demos, but spending that time getting professional sounding samples is like picking delicious, fresh, organic ingredients from the market to cook a meal. The end result is way more likely to be delicious if you start with good ingredients. Now, in terms of vocals and other live instruments, it pays to get them recorded properly. Yes, there's so much you can do with processing nowadays with tools like Melodyne, Autotune and all the different tools that we've got. But it's so much easier to just start with good quality ingredients. If you don't know any local singers, check out soundbetter.com or Vocal or just join some Facebook groups where singers are likely to hang out. Yes, there are really good quality vocals on places like Splice and Loot Cloud, but just be aware that pretty much all producers have access to these vocals. So if you want something unique to your music, you're going to have to dig it a little bit deeper. Number three is educate your ears. Now, now, this is very easy to say, but what do I actually mean like that? Well, the best thing to do is to actively listen to a lot of music. And that means not just having it on in the background, but when you're listening to it, just analyze it, work out what's going on and why it's working. In terms of actually training your ears to hear these nuances, check out a website called Sound Gym. A great alternative to that is Pro Audio Ears, but both of these websites have fun exercises which just take a few minutes each day and your ears are going to get trained to pick up these small nuances within music.
music. Now to actively listen to music, you want to be able to focus your ears on both a micro level and a macro level, and we'll be touching on both of them shortly. An example of the macro level might be working out what the structure of the track is, when the verses are happening, when the breaks are happening, when the builds and the drops are happening. And an example of the micro level might be listening to just a very small part of that track, say four bars, and picking apart every single sound that you hear. We'll be touching upon the macro analysis in a few minutes, so let's delve into a quick example of the micro analysis. If we were to listen to the first four bars of David Guetta's Titanium, we'd hear a guitar riff on first listen, which sounds like this. Now, the most basic analysis you can make of that is, okay, it's a plucked guitar riff, it's playing every 16th note, and it's following the chord progression of the track. But if we really listen, there are a few more things going on here, and this is the kind of detail we need if we're going to make professional sounding music. So the first thing worth noting is that it's very wide in the stereo field, because if we switch it to mono like this, and then back to stereo, we can hear how wide it is in our ears. And actually you could put a vector scope on there and actually see how wide it is in the stereo field. And that could have been done in a few ways. The most likely in this instance, I think, is that that riff would have been played twice, one version panned left and one version panned right. The other thing I can hear is that there's a slight reverb that occurs to the end of each of these bars. Listen carefully in the background. And it's more prominent here. You can really hear that reverb open up. So at that point, we know there's some kind of automation of a reverb from dry to wet. So you can hear already we've unlocked some real levels of detail that the average listener just won't pick up. Now to make the analysis of reference tracks easier, as long as you warp your track correctly, you can slow down your project to pick apart the nuances within the track. But do be aware that the more you slow it down, the more audio artifacts are likely to be introduced. So that's something to be aware of. Okay, tip number four. And if you've done the last tip properly, you're probably probably come to this conclusion yourself, and that is professional music aims for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Now, what on earth do I mean by that? Well, I actually believe that this applies to any technical practice. So when people start producing, their music is overly simple and it lacks nuance. It's low resolution because they simply can't hear that resolution yet. Now, after producing for a bit of time, they start to pick up all these different techniques. Perhaps they get some different plugins. Perhaps they've watched a lot of YouTube videos. But at that point, they tend to think they need to apply everything they've learned and as a result they often overcomplicate their music, apply way too many effects just because they've bought the plugins and because they've learned these new techniques and their music can end up an overcooked incoherent mess. Now this is an essential stage to go through and we all do it but then on the other side of that you get to what I call simplicity on the other side of complexity and this is where you realize that just having one or two core ideas for a track and then using all of these skills and plugins that you've learned to simply bring that forward in the strongest possible way and again harking back to point number one, everything is working to bring this theme into fruition. Now this is when you reach competence in music production. So let's listen to three examples from big tracks over the past few years. First we've got Titanium by David Guetta featuring Sia, and we've got these yellow sections which indicate one chord progression, and these green sections that indicate the second chord progression. So let's listen to the third chord progression which is with the plucked guitar. And I've changed the pitch so we don't get flagged for copyright. But that's it. So everything else, when that chord progression playing, is just bolstering that guitar. So we've got the kick, a bit of bass, and we've got Sia singing. Still the guitar though. So there's not much stuff going on. And we progress, still building up, with some beats, some sweeps, and then we've got the second chord progression. And this is the one that is in the bridge, which is this part. And then it's in the chorus as well. Same chord progression. We've got the bass, the chords, the drums, and one extra synth layer going do 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 to give it some more energy. But again, there's like four or five elements there, just processed properly, layered intelligently that just bring the idea of the track to fruition. So next let's look at a different genre. Let's look in Memoriam by, if that's how you pronounce it, by um, Ben Burma. So this is even simpler in terms of chord progression. It's one chord progression. So let's listen to that progression.
that's it. Right, so you can hear there's a lot of detail and nuance in the track, but it's one chord progression and, it, and then it's just carefully layered atmospheres to support that chord progression and create the vibe. Let's fast forward a bit. It's the same chord progression all the way through. Now we've got the beat and the bass that have come in. And you can hear the atmosphere in the background. And fast forward a little bit more. More beats. Okay, there's a top harmony play. But it's still the same chord progression. And now we've got some strings augmenting it. But that's the idea of this track. It's that one beautiful chord progression that's brought to life by all this beautiful production. It's not overly complicated. It's just executed superbly. Now again, this is just one chord progression. Why wait to say, at least I did in my way. Why wait to face. So we've got a real piano, we've got a real bass guitar, and we've got Calvin singing. And those elements form the verses of this track. So let's go to the main hook or chorus. Same chord progressions. Except now we've got a stab going with several different layers to give it size and body. And let's fast forward to where the drop hits. So playing the stabs, it sounds like there's a guitar, some kind of marimba maybe, and perhaps even a flute, so two or three layers, deliberately chosen to work together to give the effect that was required. And even if we look at genres that on the surface seem more complicated, like Bangarang by Skrillex, for example, there's still one or two ideas that are brought to fruition throughout the track. So have a listen to some of your favorite tracks and see if you can identify what those two or three core elements are that really are the heart of the track. So I view reaching this stage kind of like the first down black belt in Quran You've got enough skills to handle yourself, but of course there are still a bunch more layers after that and really you never stop learning when it comes to music production. But you've got a competent baseline from which you can then build. Okay, tip number five, and this is where we're going into the macro level and this is where I want to touch upon using energy maps. And this really helps with how you can structure your own music. Now for regular viewers of this channel, you'll know I am a big proponent, if that's the right word, of using reference tracks. And energy maps is really just one element of doing that. So each musical track is kind of like a roller coaster. And an energy map is simply drawing out that journey so you can start to understand how energy ebbs and flows throughout music, with the intention, of course, of applying that to your own music. So here's how you can do it. We are going to use Titanium again. And what I've done is create an audio channel above the track itself, our reference track, put a utility plugin on there, and that's so I can automate the gain. Now, if we turn automation on, we should be able to see the gain like this, and we can just set it to maximum. And this is going to be the most energetic part of the track. So we know that's going to be the main drops. Probably the third drop will be even the most energetic, but could be all three of the drops. So let's have a quick listen. But before we do that, it's worth noting you should correctly warp your track so that it's going to be in sync with your project, because then you can even chop things up easily like this and label them like drop, build, etc., which just makes this energy mapping experience a bit easier. For example, here we can see that that's a break. So we know that the energy is kind of down there a bit, and then that's the drops. No extra instruments there. So yeah, that's the maximum level that the track ever gets to in terms of energy. Okay, that's the next drop. So you, you can see how much easier it is when the track's in sync with the project. So you can just copy and paste little bits like this. And here, obviously, we die out down to zero energy here. So let's look at how this might look in this area here. Filters opening up slightly on the chords. So as the energy builds, we just map it out like so. So once you've done that across your whole track, you then have an energy map by which you can work out what elements need to be in which section of your music. Okay, tip number six, and this is where we're going to get a little bit more technical, but let me know in the comments if you're enjoying this, finding it useful so far. Give me a hell yeah! Or an amen brother if you're feeling holy. So tip number six is using the core sounds or the core elements of your track to create the nuance and the depth. Now one mistake that new producers make is when their music is sounding a bit empty or thin, they tend to throw lots of stuff in there. 
to try and fill it out and make it sound better. Now this can often end up in a mishmash patchwork quilt of sounds, all from different places and with different timbres, and sometimes this can be desirable depending on what you're trying to create. But unless that was your intention, quite often this is undesirable. So let me give you some examples of how you can use your core sounds to create that depth, that nuance, that texture, without having to introduce new elements to your track. One option is to use auxiliary channels for a big hall reverb, and then you can apply other effects to that reverb and use it almost as its entirely own instrument. So I've got a crystallizer by Sound Toys plugins here, and I've got an EQ, I've got a sidechain compressor. So let's have a listen to the track without this auxiliary channel turned on. Okay, it's quite nice, but now let's turn it on and see the difference that it makes, or hear the difference that it makes. And this is the track on its own. So you can hear, we've just added this sparkly magic to the track by feeding some of this piano and the choir through to this auxiliary channel which we can then process further. Another example would be if you have a vocal in your track to use a part of that vocal again to create an underlying sound bed. So if we listen to our vocal, and then find one short snippet of that vocal. Feeling good. That sounds quite good. So I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to put it on its own channel. I'm just going to repeat it and I'm going to blend them in slightly as well, just to make it a bit smoother. And then I'm going to blur it. which sounds like this. But we're going to blur that by putting a reverb on the channel itself and just putting it to 100% wet with quite a short decay. So that's just going to kind of smear it back in the mix, like so. And then of course you can process that as you see fit, perhaps take out some of those harsh frequencies. Like so. And then let's just duplicate that across the track. Now, even if we have our main vocals turned off, and this is just the beginning of the track, listen to the difference that this sound bed makes, and you could even feed a bit of this through to our auxiliary channel that we spoke about a minute ago. So this is off, and this is on. So it just bolsters the root note of the track, creates another element to your mix that's pushed back. And again, this is an example of simplicity on the other side of complexity. And you could even use existing elements to sample them and create your risers as well. Once again, tying everything in to this cohesive sound bed. Now, a lot of this comes down to creative choice. There is no rule here, but having this in your toolkit will allow you to create more timbral cohesion throughout your music and add to the togetherness of your track. Okay, number seven, and this is super important. It is having intention before you make a move. Yes, experimentation can be fun, especially with the sound design and the composition stage, but after you've done that, you've got your core idea down, having an intention for what you add or remove from the track before you actually make that move will save time and energy and result in a more professional sound. Quite often I see producers just throwing on effects or throwing on different layers because they think it needs something else, but harking back to reference tracks, if you can hear what your track is missing, then you're gonna know what to do and you can reach for your tools and create what you've envisaged in your head. This applies for EQ, this applies for saturation, this applies to layering, and this is especially true when it comes to the mixing stage. So number seven is having an intention. But of course, if you haven't been producing for a long time, sometimes you don't know what you should have in your track. And that's why reference tracks are so helpful, but it's also why my number eight tip is seeking feedback from the right places. It's the fastest way to improve, because if you've got someone listening to your track who knows what to listen out for, they can inform you on what your track is missing. Now, if you know a producer in person who's just one or two skill levels above you, that's fantastic because quite often if you get a very highly skilled producer and they're trying to coach someone who's just starting out, that producer might have forgotten what it was like to be a complete beginner and give feedback that's not really appropriate for that person at that level. 
The other thing to watch out for is seeking feedback from people who don't even like the style of music that you make. For example, you could produce the best house track in the world, play it to your friend who likes country and western, and they're gonna say it sounds rubbish because they don't like house music, no matter how well produced it is. So where can you seek feedback if you don't know a producer who produces the kind of music that you like? Well, nowadays online is a great place. You've got Discord servers, you've got Facebook groups, you've got communities like the EDM Tips Academy and the Accelerator program, where professional producers can give you weekly feedback as well as having the capability for you to seek feedback from your peers. I've linked to a few resources below including a link to the Accelerator program so you can check out the details if you like. Now some of this has been a bit philosophical, some of this has been a bit holistic, so if you want some technical things that you can apply to your music today what I've done is I've put together 14 of my most actionable mixing tips which will instantly make your music sound more professional. I absolutely guarantee it. Consider subscribing to my channel if you want music production tips each and every week. Oh and and give that little notification bell a tinkle. You know I love it. Thank you, I appreciate it, and I will catch you over at that next video.